true, man. I know. I want to keep singing, too, but we got stuff to do. You got to listen to the hyper bald guy talk for a little bit about Jesus. Good morning. Good morning, Grace Point. Man, this is a good crowd this morning, man. This morning, we are starting off a brand new series called Overcome. And it's based upon this passage in Revelation that I just read to you. And I named this series Overcome because when I study Scripture, we see God referencing us many times as overcomers. But I've noticed something over, the, over my 48 years of life. And most of those years, I've been in church, and I've been raised in church, and I've led in a church. But here's the truth of it, man. I think we say that we're believers and we believe that we overcome and we believe that we're more than conquerors, but man, how many of us live like most of the time we can barely overcome traffic on 1604? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, how do we match what we just sang and then be able to match it with our reality from day to day to day? How can we live this overcoming life that we talk about and that God says that we can have when we've been on keto diet for a month and have gained four pounds? How do we overcome, you know, when you have to wrestle your kids into the car just to get them to church, you know, and you're like, man, we need a deliverance service? Doesn't feel like we're overcoming. Here's what I've noticed. In these, in these normal moments of our lives, the non-eventful moments, just trying to get from one day to the next, what I've noticed is that if we're not careful, we could start to feel a little bit empty. And what I mean by that is we begin to see our deficits. We look in the mirror and we see what we wish we could be, but we're not, spiritually speaking. We hear a song singing about something, about having faith, and we go, oh, I should have more faith, right? There's these things, all of a sudden, that we open the door in these moments where the enemy wants to exploit those, those moments of, I wish I could be more. And what happens is the enemy comes in, and that's the voice of the accuser that we just read about in Revelation. And he will come in, and he'll try to mimic one of two voices in most cases. He will try to sound like the voice of God. And you go, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I should be more. I should have more faith. I should be this. I should be that. I, right? Or it sounds a lot like ours. It sounds like me talking. And I'm like, yeah, that's true, right? Right? Like how many of y'all, you look back maybe the last week or the last five years or 25 or even 50 years, and you can point to things that if you give them too much attention, you'll start feeling bad about it again, and you start feeling guilty, and you're like, how in the world could I be so dumb? Yo, really, really? Okay, nine of us in here? Okay, uncommon dishonesty, okay? That is not one of our values. The truth is, is that we look back in our lives, and we can all point to things, and we go, how could I be so stupid? Or how could I have been so bad? There's a time when I was writing this sermon out in this little intro that I worked so hard to, work, to present to you guys just now. There was a story that I was reminded of, and a couple of you may know it, but when I was in middle school into high school, there was this young lady by the name of Christine who just really rung my bell. I thought she was the cutest girl in school, and I did my best to like make her my girlfriend, but I've learned since that you actually have to ask them out and not just hope it happens by osmosis, okay? And so, you know, just dating tips for the young men in here. But here's the thing. Um, I never was able to pull the trigger on this thing, and I wound up becoming her, like, her big brother. You know that nonsense in high school? Um, and so she's like, oh, he's like my big brother, but I'm like, oh, your big brother wants to take you out on a date. You know what I mean? It's like this is... So we get out of high school. We never really were an item, but now I'm a grown man. I run into her, and she's a grown woman now, and I asked her out on a date. And this is my, in my late teens, early 20s at this point. And uh, she said yes. Like a real date, like a big boy date. You know, I'm going to take her out and feed her and show a movie and, you know, take her home safely like a real date, you know. And so <laughs> here's what happened. So this is in San Antonio. This is 1989, 1990. And uh, it's in the middle of summer. I have a car with no air conditioning, right, And um, which is okay. You know, I'm just I'm going to push through the pain. But I'm driving to the date, and here's what happened. You have to understand, number one, if you do the math, I've waited half of my life for this moment, okay? Um, so I'm driving to her place, and I'm doing a hygiene check. And so I look in the rearview mirror. I see my beautiful fluffy mullet because it was in style. Oh, it was so glorious, yes. I did have that back in the day. Did a booger check. Okay, everything's looking good there. No mocos. And then <sighs> I look at my, my breath, smell it. Okay, everything's fine. But I get to my armpits and I realized, guys, I forgot to put deodorant on. In the middle of summer, 181 degrees, car no AC, San Antonio, Texas, July. Okay? So I'm like, I can't stop for the date because I don't want to make a bad impression on this girl that I've been waiting half my life to go out on a date. And so I can't be late. What am I going to do? I'm like, I'll figure it out. So I get to her place. I knock on the door. She opens it. I'm like, oh, my gosh. 
It's here. It's like New Year's Day, my birthday, and Groundhog Day all wrapped into one. And so we sit down. It's going to be one of those kind of chilled out dates. And I was like, hey, what do you want to do? And she's like, I don't know. What do you want? She really didn't talk that way, but for this story, she did. I don't know. What do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I'd think about it. I said, hey, do you mind if I use your bathroom real quick before we go? She's like, absolutely. I was like, sweet. So I go in. I shut the door. I turn on the fan. I lock the door. I turn the water on. I open up her medicine cabinet like a good creeper does, right? I open up her medicine cabinet. True story. I pull out her deodorant. Take it. I'm buttoning my shirt. I'm like, this is so legit. This is Christine's deodorant, guys. This is a big deal. So I put the cap back on. I put it in the medicine cabinet. I shut it. And I'm looking at my hair. I'm like, okay, this is the moment, Dave. Come on, man. This is going to be great. But all of a sudden, I started to feel like, a, like heat <laughs> emanating from my armpits. And I'm like. And then it started really hurting. And then it felt like someone took blow torches to my armpits. And I'm like, what in the world? is happening to my body right now. I unbutton my shirt. I reach under. I'm like, ah, this really hurts. There's like armpit hair all over my hand. I reach into the other armpit. There's armpit hair on this hand. True story. Now there's armpit hair all over her vanity. It smells like the devil has shown up in this place. I'm like, what in the world is going on? It's a mess. I'm freaking out. I'm in pain. I'm losing my hair starting in a very weird place. It didn't start here. It's, I open up the medicine cabinet. I'm like, what did I just put on my body? I pull out her deodorant, and some of the ladies have already figured it out. I put Nair on my armpits, guys. I was in there for 15 minutes cleaning up hair, trying to get that smell out of there. She's out there waiting the whole time. Not a good first impression for a date, children, okay? That's not what you want to do is camp out in the bathroom. Why do I share this story with you? Because this is the pastor the Lord has chosen to give you. <laughs> but here's the other reason why I share this is because when I look back, every time I share this story, I feel so dumb. Because this is just one thing in my life, that long string of dumbness and making mistakes and doing things. And I'm like, why did I involve myself in that? Why did I do that? Can anybody relate on some level to what I just shared? Am I the only one in here? Yeah. How in the world I did not feel like an overcomer in that moment? How do we feel and step into this life that God says that we can have as overcomers when we're putting nair on our armpits by accident? What happens is, is then in our moments of dumbness, stupidity, and it's sin, right? Those moments where we've chosen to do something that isn't right, that goes against what is in that moment, we open the door wide open in our quieter moments for the enemy, the accuser, to show up and say, you're a bad person. You're not a good parent. You're a terrible spouse. What kind of friend are you? What kind of Christian are you? And we begin to look, and the thing is, is the accuser is normally right. It will highlight the things that we've actually done that are wrong. And we go, I feel so guilty. I feel bad. What do you do with the voice of the accuser? How, how do we respond to this? Because we cannot ha be overcomers if we still have this voice active in our lives. We're going to talk about that this morning because we cannot overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony if we still allow the accuser to have free reign in our lives. There's a situation that I want to highlight, and it's the story about Jesus. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered around him and sat, and he sat down, and they began to teach them. So the context is very similar to this. Where Jesus is teaching, there's a crowd of people listening to what he has to say. But as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious, what does that say, the religious law, right? And the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. This is not rumor. This is not some sort of idea that maybe, no, no, no. They catch her in the middle of of making a terrible mistake with her life, sleeping with a married man. They don't probably give her even the dignity to get dressed. They probably take her out as she was. Now she's in public in the temple courts in front of hundreds of people, Jesus and these religious leaders, okay? They caught her. They're so excited. And they put her in front of the crowd, and they said, Teacher, this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, the law of Moses says to stone her. So, they're, so as they're quoting the law, and they're right, whether we like the law or whether we don't, it is the law. If you're caught in the act of adultery, you're about to be killed in a very brutal way. 
This is a shameful, terrible, undignified death. You're going to be stoned to death. And so this woman, I can only imagine what's going through her mind, the shame, the embarrassment of being naked and exposed in the quietest secret moment of her life. And now it's like, boom, broad daylight in front of everybody. And the law says, rightly, you are doomed to die. They pick up the stones. Jesus is there. And they say, the law of Moses says to stone her. Jesus, what do you say? They were right. But there's an underlying motive with these religious leaders, and I think you could smell it, can't you? Something isn't fully right. It's not like they're looking to restore her or bring her to an understanding of what holy living as a God follower should look like. No, it says in Scripture they're trying to trap Jesus into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote in the dust with his finger. Well, that's an interesting response. No one knows in Scripture why he was, what he was writing, why he stoops down and does this. But they kept demanding an answer, like, Jesus, stop writing in the dirt and answer the question. So he stood up again, and he said, all right, great, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And now he moves out of the way. Now it's showtime. But then he stooped down again and began to write in the dust again. Theologians have pondered this for centuries, what he was writing. And I agree with the certain theologians that say when they study this passage, it could have been. Maybe he's writing her name and with an arrow going, you've slept with her too. That's why you know she's got this reputation, hot shot. Right? Oh, here's this, this, this is the thing that you're guilty for. Maybe he, I, we don't know. But all we know is something happened between him saying, throw the stone, and him writing in the dirt. Because when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. You don't slip away unless you're, like, trying to be quiet and discreet. In other words, you're like, this is what slipping away looks like. <laughs> Until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Notice this woman hasn't spoken a word yet. You catch that? Jesus has done all the talking. Jesus stood up again, and I can imagine that his smile's beginning to show up on his face. And he says, uh, where are your accusers? It's weird. What happened? It's strange. He said, didn't even one of them condemn you? She said, no, Lord. No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, well, neither do I. He said, go and send no more. And we love this story because we love it when Jesus tells us, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. We go, thank you, Lord. But there's another part of us that kind of goes, look, at least should if he like put her in six weeks of counseling, right? Before you can be forgiven, you, you got to go through these steps or, hey, listen, listen, sweetheart, while you're here, you got to stop living like this. You got to stop sleeping with married women. Men, that's not right. That's the wrong thing to do. Straighten up your acts. I just saved you from being stoned to death, but go. Don't do it. No, he doesn't. He says, I don't condemn you. Go in grace. Just go and sin no more. That doesn't seem like enough. And you go, oh, but you know what? If you were Jesus, you wouldn't, you, if you're in this position, I don't know if we would be, we would handle it like him. We go, well, someone needs to be, hold her accountable at least, right? She's sleeping with me, right? We would want some sort of something called justice to be, okay, you've been forgiven, however, comma. But there's something in the story that doesn't seem right because it's not like she's falsely accused. She's accurately accused, and Jesus just let this woman who commits adultery and sleeps with other, men, other women's men go. Go and say no more. What do you do with that? She walked away scot-free. And as I wrestled with this passage, and I've never preached it this way before, this is what the Lord put on my heart. I think that there's a much bigger story being written here than we even realize. Yes, Jesus is gracious, and yes, there's nothing else to the story as we hear it. But however, there's something significant that is not spoken in this passage that is a game changer. But in order to understand that, you have to rewind all the way back to Leviticus. Once a year, there was this day called the Day of the Covering. It was called Yom Kippur. It means the day to cover. It was the Day of Atonement. And the high priest, just to kind of set this up, now don't get lost on me. I'm teaching you deep Bible stuff right now, but it's going to rock your world because what he would do is he would offer a sacrifice for his own sins as a high priest, but then he would select two young goats, okay? 
and he would bring them before the Lord. And these two goats he would put before the Lord, and he would basically draw lots. In other words, he would like flip a coin, heads or tails, which goat was going to be sacrificed for the sins of Israel unto God. The other goat was going to be set free, free to go. It's called the scapegoat. And so the high priest would then take the goat designated to be killed, and the priest would take a scarlet rope made of wool, and he would tie it around the neck of the goat. Now follow this. That means he was set apart to be sacrificed for the sins of Israel. Now, if the sacrifice was accepted by God, if you read the, the, just the background on this, what you would learn is that the, the red rope would turn white if the, offer or the sacrifice was acceptable to God. This is very symbolic. It's a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do for us because the prophet Isaiah prophesied about Jesus showing up hundreds of years later. And this is what he says in Isaiah. Though your skins be as scarlet, they're going to be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And so the high priest would then kill the Lord's goat. He would collect the blood from this goat that had been sacrificed. It was then taken into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat, which sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant in God's presence. Then the scapegoat would be taken, and the bloody hands of the priest would be placed on the head of the scapegoat, and God, he would confess the sins of Israel and then let this goat run free. Now, why are we talking about this? Because there were two goats, one offering. Grace point, it takes both goats to understand what God wants us to see about this story about the woman caught in the act of adultery. Israel understood that killing a goat meant someone or something had to die for sins. The death of the goat sacrificed to God communicates that God is actually willing to accept a substitute on the behalf of someone else for the remission of sins. So, you're like, okay, two goats. I don't know where we're going. Fast forward to the last hours of Jesus' life. He's been arrested. He's been falsely accused. We know this part of the story. He's brought before this government leader called Pilate. And so it says, and meanwhile, the leading priests and the religious teachers of the law Dadgummit, they're here again. It says they're here and they're shouting their what? The voice of the accuser has shown up, has he not? And he's, they're, they're, they're just so, they're so close to seeing Jesus killed and done with once and for all. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and the other religious leaders along with the people and he announced the verdict. He said, listen, you brought this man to me. What did you do? You accused him of leading a revolt, but I've examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence, and I find him innocent. Jesus has done nothing wrong. With a mighty roar, the crowd said, kill him and release Barabbas to us. Well, who is Barabbas and why do we care? Well, Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government. He's a lawbreaker. He's a rebel in the worst way, and come to find out, he's a murderer. You ready? Pilate finds Jesus innocent, and Pilate argued with him because he wanted to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus. Because it was Passover during this time, it was the custom to release a prisoner with no questions asked and set them free. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to die, as they demanded, Scripture says. And they had requested, as they had requested, he released Barabbas, the man in prison for insurrection and murder, but he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. In this moment, guys, do you see what just took place? The innocent one swapped places with the guilty one. The choosing of the two goats, putting one to death, letting another one go. Jesus, the innocent, standing shoulder to shoulder with Barabbas, the woman caught in adultery, shoulder to shoulder with you and with me. We were able to walk off that stand that day, released, and the innocent one said, I'll take the punishment. While we see in the Old Testament a scarlet rope put upon the Lord's goat, remember that part? Look at what happened after this. In Matthew 27, it says, some of government, the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. Look what they did. They stripped Jesus and they put a scarlet robe on him. Not only for the woman caught in the act of adultery, but Jesus stepped into the role of becoming the Lord's sacrificial goat for all of us. 
sent us to death. You see, for the wages of sin is death, is it not? In Leviticus, the high priest would wash his hands after he let the scapegoat go. What do we see Pilate doing? Washing his hands, saying, I'm done. God said, I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. So there's some finality beginning to take place as it results to our lawlessness and our brokenness and the holy goodness and justice of God. God cannot be a loving God unless he's a just God. He sees the same broken world that you see. He sees the scars that you see on yourself and he goes, someone has to pay. But the truth is, is you also have put scars on other people's hearts. There's all these acts of injustices that are irreconcilable, and we are due to die. We deserve to pay for our own sins. The accuser says that, and we have to agree. But Jesus, everybody say, but Jesus. He's in so many words, he's saying, listen, to the woman caught in the act of adultery, to you and to me, he's saying, go and sin no more. I'll take the death sentence. I'll take the stones. I'll die and fulfill the law on your behalf so that you can walk free, Barabbas, woman caught in the adultery, and Grace Point West, 11 o'clock service. You see, the prosecution has all the evidence it needs to point out when, where, how, and why you've done what you've done pointing to how you've purposely broken God's laws, stood in defiance of him. But Pastor Dave, I'm a good person. Good for you. I'd like to think I'm a pretty decent person too. But the problem is this. Let's set the Bible aside for a second. Let's say that you say, okay, my standard of moral goodness is to not lie. How many of y'all would say, that's good. It's good not to lie. Y'all know where this is going because you're reluctant to raise your hand. This isn't got you. This is just logic, y'all. Okay? You don't have to believe in God to go lying is bad. Okay. What about judging people? How many of y'all agree judging people is probably not the nicest thing to do? We all should be raising our hands at this point. I got more. Lord, I got a lot of work to do. You got a lot of work to do. Um, Because that one person like, no, judging people's great. (laughs) Um, No, it's not as bad. But here's the thing. Here's the issue. How many of y'all have lied before? Raise your hand. All right, Lord, you see them all. Thank you, Lord. Un- uncommon transparency. How many of you all saying judging people is bad? Looking at them and judging them? Okay, right. Yeah, we all know this. The truth is, is that even if you don't believe in God today, do you understand the truth is, is that you can't even live up to your own moral code of right and wrong? So you break your own laws of right and wrong. The truth is none of us is righteous, not even one of us. So we may be good, but compared to who? Charles Manson? Okay. You see, there's an issue here. There's a real issue because regardless of how good we may try to be, good is not good enough. But in the presence of Jesus, when we trust him, when the stones of righteousness and the law go, you deserve to die for what you've done wrong, when the accusations come flying out of the mouths of our accusers, The good news is because of Jesus and what he has done, we don't have to defend, we don't have to protest, we don't have to argue with our accuser anymore. Now, this is where I want you to lean in and hear this, because if we're going to be overcomers, we have to understand how we have overcome. It is by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, but we've got to tell our testimonies to ourselves. Because we're so prone to forget, and we go put ourselves back under the law, and so when the voice of the accuser begins to accuse us of things that we've done in the past that we've already asked and been washed by the blood by, we give him more. All we need to do is in the moment, we don't have to defend ourselves to the accusing voice, we look to our advocate. That woman didn't say a word. Jesus did all the talking. We look to our advocate. You go, who's my advocate? Your advocate is Jesus. He's the one who wrote the law, and now he serves as your attorney before God. Did you know that? And listen, you want someone representing you who wrote the law. He knows it inside and out. It was authored from his own heart. He knows the rules, and he's not looking for loopholes. He's looking for finality, and when he said, it is finished, it's done. So when we're accused and the voice of the accuser wants to bring up the past and say, what of this and what of that and why can't you be more, you go, no. Jesus says it is finished. Jesus, it says in 1 John, my dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you're not going to sin. He says, however, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads with our Father. 
He is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who's truly righteous. Guys, aren't you starting to see how much he loves you? How much he's invested in you? You're not a chore for him. He loves you. Jesus. So when the enemy comes and says, it's over, you go, no, actually, you're wrong. Actually, no, it is finished. Because with the the dying breath, the last thing that Jesus says on the cross, as he paid the final bill for your sins, he says, it is finished. Done. So guess what we get to say? It is finished. You see... God doesn't have any time for the accuser. Why do we? Guys, how would we live if we truly allowed the Lord to staple his mouth shut and just go, no, I walk under a new authority. I have an advocate. Yeah. You see, as the band comes up, I want to revisit Revelation because this is a big deal. Because the reality is, is we don't have to give place to the voice of the accuser anymore. It says, then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it's come at last, salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has what? Been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. But we have overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. There's a liberation to where you're not even afraid to die for the cause of Christ anymore because you're so free in him. You're not trying to preserve anything because you have have nothing to preserve. You've been preserved by the blood of Jesus. We're eternal. We're new creations in Christ. We're about to see that displayed before our eyes again this morning as we enter into the the time of baptism. So if you would do me a favor, stand to your feet. The author of Romans says this. Now catch this. He says, oh my gosh. Do you not realize what you've been given? Like, he's not being ugly. He's just like, can you believe how good this is? He's like, do you not understand what you even have? He's like, don't you get it? The voice of accusation has been silenced forevermore because of Jesus. He says, look, if you've put your faith, all eyes on me, if you put your faith in Jesus, look what scripture says. He's like, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? He's like, this is like Jesus 101. If you've been forgiven, there's no voice of the accuser that has the power in your life anymore to tell you the way you should be and you should go. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. If it doesn't feel like kindness, it's not of the Lord. God is not here to bring shame and to expose you. That's what the law does. Jesus says, no, come, all, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. I will cover you. I will put my robe of righteousness around you. Robe of righteousness. He took the crimson road. We wear white robes. Man, God is so good. He says, no, no one can accuse us anymore, for God has given us right standing with himself. This is the word of God. This is not suggestive. I'm not Tony Tony Robbins of Grace Point. This is the word of God. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Jesus Christ died for us and was raised to life for us, and he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, and he's pleading for you, and he's pleading right now. And I believe for some of you, he's going, Father, please let them hear what is being said, because this is going to be a life changer. This is going to change their marriage. This is going to change their homes. This is going to change their destiny. God, please let by the power of your Holy Spirit, let it penetrate in this room right now. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he doesn't love us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted, hungry, destitute, danger, or even threatened with death? He's saying, listen, bad stuff's going to happen, but nothing's going to separate you from me. He says, listen, Noah, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves you, Grace Point. And I'm convinced that nothing could ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate you from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, indeed, nothing in all of creation, including you, yourself, including your weak days or your strong days. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Guys, this is uncommon. This is uncommon in a world that says you better make it yourself. Make it about yourself. 
Step on whoever you need to step on to get the job done. Guys, do you realize Jesus has said there's another way to live? We can just give because we've been given. Guys, when, you, when you're starting your normal day tomorrow, the voice of the accuser is going to try to remind you of some stuff, and he's going to try to discount what you just heard today. Yeah, but. You just say, <laughs> I'm about me to preach or cuss right now. Here's, here's what I'm trying to say. It's so vital. It's so vital to take this, the, the voice of the accuser seriously because you're tethered to nothing. Don't give the devil a foothold when he tries to throw up your past in your face. You go, today I'm going to choose to believe what Jesus said. If he says it's finished, it's finished. I don't get to make up the rules. Take it up with the advocate. I'm not talking anymore. Right? This is called warfare. Why? Do you realize what has just happened in your own life? You've overcome the accuser. You have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Preach your testimony to yourself this week. This morning... We get to celebrate the beauty of that. And the word of this young lady's testimony, let me pull it up for my beautiful wife because I have the honor of baptizing you. I'm so excited, Elena. So Sarah, take it away. Well, this is a sweet day. I've actually known Elena since before she was born, so it's really awesome. Um, Elena's story, and this is what she wrote, my life before Jesus was chaotic. I believed I had to fix my own problems and I couldn't rely on others to fix them. I believed I shouldn't rely on God or Jesus to fix my problems either. I made bad decisions, decisions I regret now. I was also not much of a believer. Sure, I went to church and prayed, but I was always questioning if God was real. I see now that yes, he is real and yes, he can help me. My faith is completely restored. On September 29th, 2019, me and my family came to church, but that day felt different. I felt hopeful and sang the songs with more spirit than I ever have. Pastor David led a prayer to exchange my life, and it was and is the best decision I have and ever will make. My life is now full of hope and faith. Like now I can finally breathe, and then I am no longer suffering, suffocating from the weight of my sins. I am truly happy now, and my life has never been better. And this is Elena's one statement. I was once a person of little faith and a slave to sin, and now I am a true believer and free in Christ because God forgave me. So Elena, because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. If that doesn't melt your heart, man, then I don't know what to tell you. Microphone to stop working at this point. (laughs) Um, This is what it's about. Do you realize Jesus stepped in Elena's place so that she can go free? This is us. This is this is it. But maybe you're here and you're like, I've never heard it like this before. I really thought, David, if I was a good person, that's good enough. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm just simply here to say that you can actually walk out of these doors complete and whole in Christ, a new creation. And so would you just bow your heads right now? And I'm just going to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. The stones of accusation are aimed at you. But you don't have to die under the power and the weight of the law. You can go free because Jesus took the stones and the death penalty for you. If you want to exchange your life for the life of Jesus, if you want to exchange your sin for the forgiveness of Jesus, pray with me right now to Jesus who's hearing your prayer. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. In this moment, I put my faith in you to be my Savior, to be my advocate, to be my Redeemer and my Restorer. In this moment, I exchange my sin for the life and the forgiveness of Jesus. I will follow you the rest of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. 
And if you prayed that for the first time, you met it from the bottom of your heart, I'm going to ask you not to do anything other than just raise your hand if you just prayed that right now. Let me just see a show of hands. I know y'all were praying. Let me see. Come on. Raise them high. I see them. Come on. Look around the room. I see. Come on. Be bold about this. This is good. This is a good thing. This is not a confession. This is a celebration. Come on. I see you. I see you. Who else? I saw you. Anybody back there? Anybody back there? Yep. Man, praise God. Praise God. If you prayed that, all I'm asking is that there's a little card in your seat. Take a moment, fill it out so we can celebrate the decision you just made. But Grace Point, be blessed. And we're going to continue to take steps into understanding from a practical standpoint what it means to live as overcomers because this is a new day and it's a new season for Grace Point in San Antonio. And God has invited us into that. So start inviting your friends and your neighbors and your enemies. Get them in church. Let Jesus love them like he's loved us. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you all next time.